Welcome to the podcast. I'm Gene Natalie with Troutwood, and today we're going to be speaking with my friend, Jackie Cummings Koski. Jackie is retired, but she's way too young to be retired. We're going to dive into how it happened because in Jackie's case, it was planned for and carefully executed. Jackie, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Gene, how are you doing? Thank you for having me today. It's my pleasure. And I think we need to, to tell everyone it was eight years ago that you and I met. <laughs> yeah, that's been a long time. I can't even believe that. But my daughter um, was graduating from high school at the time. So it was 2013. And man, does time fly. It does. And we were talking beforehand. She's doing quite well. It sounds like proud mom. I am. I am. Well, and then let's just, because I've been on her website, what's your daughter's website and what is she doing? We have to say real quick. Yeah, she is a brilliant graphic designer and her website is visuallyamber.com uh, and uh, she's done some amazing work and now she is 25. It sounds so crazy saying that. Time, 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 right? Every young person listening, yeah. time goes so much faster than you think it does. Yes, it does. It does. It's crazy. So Jackie, we met eight years ago at the Eiffel Conference that the Financial Literacy Institute puts on each year. We wrote both authored books that rec were recognized with awards uh, back in 2013. Yeah. So forever, our, our real babies will you know, always be the same age. <laughs> yes, yes. Tell us about your book before we dive into the episode here. Yeah, well, well, the book um, is uh, titled Money Letters to My Daughter. And as I mentioned, my uh, the, the year that the book, book was published was the year that my daughter graduated from high school. And the whole idea of the book was not to necessarily be a New York Times bestseller or anything like that. But it's everything that I learned about personal finance and money management throughout my life. And I didn't want to lose what I learned. So I put it all in a book. I was always a writer. You know, my my major in school um, college was communications and journalism. And the best way to sort of um, memorialize and to share everything that I had learned um, was to put it in a book. And I started writing it when my daughter was 14 years old. And I wanted to have it finished by the time she graduated from high school. And so money letters to my daughter, even if I only sold one copy and it went to her, that was success to me. I, I love that, Jackie. Uh, and I, I can echo that sentiment, uh, having kids myself. Um, yeah. We're going to spend most of our time talking finance, sharing your expertise, answering the question how you did it, because it's extremely inspirational. But first, just tell us a little bit about yourself, the non-finance side of Jackie. Okay. Well, the non-finance side, I grew up in the South, um, South Carolina and Georgia. And I was um, raised by a single dad with six kids. I was number five out of six. It was crazy. And at the time, I didn't even realize how unusual that was. But my dad, he was amazing. He was a hard worker. And um, he provided for us. You know, we were poor growing up, but he made sure we had what we needed. And, and again, I still, don't, I still don't know how he did that. I mean, six kids. Um, so it, it was a struggle, um, you know, growing up, obviously, because money was short. You know, my dad was just a factory worker, so he didn't have a lot of money. And uh, we didn't talk about money growing up. And so he got sick. Uh, he had cancer when I was in, a senior in high school, and he ended up passing away wow. a few months before my graduation. I'm so sorry, that, yeah, so that was a big that was a big deal for me. And I was so young, I really didn't understand. But at that point, I was on my own. So I was on my own at 18 and um, started college. Um, was able to graduate, you know, didn't do super well because I had to work full time the entire time. I mean one of the greatest things my dad taught me was to, to work hard. And so I wasn't getting the student loans and the way that I was taught to pay for what you need was to work. So I worked 40 plus hours a week the entire time I was in college and taking a full load. So that was, that was really tough. And obviously something had to give. So it was my grades. I mean, I, I didn't, um, I didn't have the highest GPA. I think um, I had like maybe a 2.6. And in order to graduate, you had to have a 2.5. So I barely <laughs> scraped by. But I did. I did. Honestly, the lessons that I learned about balancing life, uh, working, trying to make ends meet, paying for my tuition, figuring out how to do all that 
was probably more of a lesson than the school, the my program itself at school. So um, I started my first job um, out of college, and it was at Walmart headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas. So I was very happy to even have a job out of college in my field. My field was communications. And I was there for like three years. Um, I got married and my husband was in the army. So when he got out, we were really more concerned about his career, honestly, than mine. And he ended up getting a job in Ohio. And so we up and moved to Ohio. And as soon as got to Ohio, I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> so I had my daughter um, and, you know, things were kind of crazy. I finally got out of retail um, because when I when we moved to Ohio, I stayed with Walmart and I just went to a retail store. And so about I was married for about 11 years and we ended up getting a divorce. And that was devastating. Um, it's, it's a huge change in your life. And that was kind of an awakening for me around my finances, because all of a sudden what I, what I thought was going to be a shared journey ended up being, you know, me and my daughter, and I had to make sure she was taken care of. And that's when I started thinking about, okay, I need to make sure I understand my finances. I need to make sure that um, I make sure we're okay. I don't want to ever be in poverty again. So all these things are going through my head. And um, probably the biggest thing I remember was that when it came to the retirement accounts, when I was getting divorced, I had $20,000 in my 401k at work. And I thought that was great, but my husband had $120,000. So he had $20,000 more than me. Um, and, and I kept asking myself why, and I felt so financially ignorant at that time. And, 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 and I just never wanted to feel that way again. So that was the starting point for me to get my financial life together, not just for me, but also for my, um, daughter. So, um, I started doing a lot of things, um, better at that point, being more conscious about what I was doing. And I joined an investment club because those were people that talked about finances, talked about investing. I liked being around them. And I would say probably after I was divorced for about two years, I started really kicking it into gear. I mean, I was maxing out all of my tax advantage accounts. And before I knew it, uh, when I first sat down to do my first net worth statement, which was 2013. I did my first net worth statement. That was the most powerful exercise I had ever done around my finances. And I was halfway there, not even knowing what I was doing. And so I started thinking about, wow, I'm really loving, you know, financial literacy. I love teaching about finance. I would go to high schools and um, after I wrote the book, that's when I really started going to high schools and colleges and teaching other kids about money. Teachers were happy to have me in there. And that's what I wanted to do. I felt like that was my calling and that was my reason for being here on this earth. But I just couldn't do it and also work full time. So I had to make the choice. And that's when I decided, how can I make it happen to where I can do this all the time and do my life's work? And that's what kind of brings me here today. Oh, I love that. Jackie, yeah, I, I think that just to, I want to catch one of your earlier comments because I similarly have a lot of interaction with high school and college students. And I sense there is pressure that maybe when they're in a tough situation that they think I'm the only one who's ever been in this situation. Right. And you were hit with the tragedy at the age of 18. Um, with five siblings, where were you in that order in terms of age? I I was number five. So I had one sister that was younger than me and she was like a year and a half younger than me. Okay. Um, is there any, just any, anything you would say to maybe a young, a young person in that situation right now in terms of advice or, or what you did to make it through? Yeah. You know, even at 18, that's still a very young age. <laughs> and there's just a lot of, of hurt and change at that time. And I think because I was focusing on school and focusing on some different things that was helpful for, for me. But the one thing I can say, so when I talk about my dad today, all these years later, it doesn't make me sad anymore. It makes me remember the good things and the things I learned from him. He taught me how to work hard how to be a good person and that debt was not good. So 
I always smile when I think about him now. But right after it happened, it was hard for me to, you know, if somebody would say, I'm sorry about your dad, that would make me cry because it was just so sad to even talk about it. And now I I, I always say it with a smile because I'm thinking about all the great things about my dad. So I guess just yeah. know that as time goes on very slowly, your tears start to turn into to smiles and laughs and remembering so many of the good things that this person instilled in you. And I, I, I firmly feel like he, we all have a purpose on this earth. And I think that his purpose was to raise his kids. And he did that. Like I had one younger sister that was 17, but we were basically all adults at that time. So his life's work was raising his kids. And that's what he did. Oh, God bless him, Jackie. And that, <laughs> Yeah, well, when you started, uh, I, I have four kids, and I was thinking, wow, um, yeah, raising six kids is a, he, he's a hero. Yeah, um, absolutely. I definitely think of him as a hero. You said something else that was really interesting. You had twenty thousand eleven years eleven years later, or maybe a, a little bit of an add on from there from when you you started. You, know, you, you had money in your four hundred one k. You determined it wasn't enough, but you did something important. It sounds like you kept it in there. That's true. You know, I, I think that I didn't give myself enough credit for that because obviously I could have felt not financially. I think I was OK, but I think emotionally you think I need all the money I can get right now. And so I, I probably had the choice to just cash out the money, pay the penalty, pay the taxes or whatever. But I, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I just knew that um, it was better for me to think longer term. And I think that's what made me keep it in there because, you know, I had a job, I was working, but thinking long term, you know, my daughter was not going to be 11 year, years old forever. And I had to make sure we were going to be okay. And, and the funny thing you asked, because um, when it all was said and done and we split Basically, they put all the retirement money in one pot and split it down the middle. I ended up with $60,000 and I rolled it over to um, an IRA, an individual retirement account. And I started making sure that that was invested. And this was, this would have been 2004 or something like that. So that $60,000, the last time I checked, the balance in that account, I never took a pin, I never took anything out and I never put anything in. It always stayed that original $60,000. And so as of 2021, that account has grown to $280,000. So I'm pretty proud of that. And every, and I, I like keeping that account separate because every time I look at it, it is a reminder of the value of compound growth um, to hold on to long-term money and to make sure that it's invested. And it, it represents sort of my epiphany around financial education and learning about money, investing, and personal finance. Jackie, how did you know in 2004, that, that you throw a, a tough situation, that, that 20,000, that's a tough, the great vacations, that's rent, that's food on the table, that's more. How, what? How, where do you think that that knowledge to say, stay the course, stay, stay invested? Where where did that come from? Well, as far as staying invested, um, I think it was more like feeling secure. So the the, the twenty thousand dollars I started with, and then right after the divorce, you know, the sixty thousand was more around that. This is a safety net for me and my daughter, which goes back to things that my dad taught me. You know, you need to have something on the side if an emergency happened. And that's another thing. If something bad happened or an emergency came up, now I felt like it was just on me. Like I couldn't, I didn't have an, the other half, you know, I didn't have my husband. So um, I think that was what motivated me to hold on to that money because it represented like safety and security and, and sort of the backup if something went wrong. And I ask because I, I, send, I tend to see the opposite and, you know, a, a stressful period of life, we tend to, you know, maybe not think long term, we think short term. And right. you made a very important decision. And I want to, you said 20,000, then 60,000, today 280,000. But the way you said it made it sound easy. And I wrote down <laughs> the time periods as you were talking because right. 2004 was a great year, but you hit something 
from 2007 to 2009 that wasn't easy, the great financial crisis. And it sounds like you stayed invested through the whole period. I, I did. And, you know, boy, when I look, look back at that, so 2008 was obviously that awful year. And the funny thing was um, my ex-husband worked at a bank, a very large bank, one of the top four banks, okay? And part of the money in the 401k back then, and I think this was pre-Enron, but part of the 401k, one of the options was investing in the bank's stock. It was a large publicly traded bank. And I had some money in there. And I think it was ugh, probably 2006 that I said, you know, this should be in mutual funds or whatever. I don't know why I, I thought that. I, I just did. You know, I think at that point I may have been doing more reading and research and knew that it was better to not have a, too much money in a single stock and, not, and, and it should be an index fund. So I switched it probably around 2006, 2007. And it turned out to obviously be a good time because banks got hit the hardest in 2008. But I kept it invested. And I guess I was just thankful that I was out of that bank stock. And I kept it. And, and you know what? I think really it, it, it just kept being a reminder of this change in my life and becoming financially whole and just having a longer term mindset. So, yeah, I still I still still kept it working. Um, but around 2008, I'm sure it had the huge slide, just like, you know, pretty much everything else that was in the stock market. You, everything you just said is worth, for educators listening, that is worth a, an entire classroom to discuss because individual stocks, particularly bank stocks, they went out of business in the financial crisis. They didn't yeah. exist. When they go to business, your investment goes to zero. Yep. Your decision to move into a diversified portfolio of mutual funds didn't mean you didn't lose money during that time period, but it didn't go out of business. And then it's now worth $280,000. Exactly. And I, I am glad that I did do, you know, a little bit of research to know that having the single stock was not good. I did have it for, for a couple of years. And honestly, you know, before 2008, banks were probably one of the best performing sectors and I was getting mm -hmm. some good returns. Um, but I guess I, I, you know, one of the things my dad taught me was um, I, don't be greedy, you know? So I was happy that it had done so well. I knew it did was doing better than the rest of the stock market, but I knew um, I shouldn't be greedy and that it wouldn't be going up that way forever. And um, again, it turned out to be just good timing more than anything. But had I not read and did a little bit of research to know that that wasn't a good thing. I don't know that I would have had the foresight to know that I needed to change, you know, having all that money in, in a bank stock. Jackie, I sometimes joke uh, that if there was a way to have like fireworks come out in like the screen, <laughs> that's a statement where I like bring your Harry Potter wand and make fireworks. <laughs> uh, you and I have lived two very stressful investment periods in the dot-com crisis from 2001 and the great financial crisis. Yeah, we sure did. Um, it's so funny. At 13 years, a lot happens, right? <laughs> yeah. It, well, but but to you, made, you made a, a very kind of powerful statement. You made a lot of money in bank stocks prior to the financial crisis. But yeah. if you didn't sell those bank stocks that dropped very steeply, it was a different equation. Yeah, that account would not be worth $280,000 more than likely because they never really came back as strong as they slid back in 2008. Well, and I, dating myself, Jackie, I remember buying companies in like the late 90s, 2000. If it had .com on the name, you bought it, it doubled and you thought you were smarter than you are. Yeah, exactly. Now, I did dabble just a little bit. And the only good thing that came out of that was that I hardly had any money. <laughs> so <laughs> because whatever money I had got lost. So so to younger people and, and, and teachers that, you know, are often asked by younger people, I want to invest in this stock. Ooh, 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 it's like, you know what? It's kind of OK to, you know, they have all this enthusiasm. So you don't want to douse their enthusiasm. So it's better to learn these lessons when you're super young and you don't have any money than when you have a lot of money. So during the dot-com bubble, I was young. I was throwing my money at, like you said, I, I remember this one company, salon.com. They 
they went bankrupt and I lost all my money. I think I put in like a thousand dollars and it went down to like eighty dollars. And I said, Oh, I might as well take the eighty dollars and go have dinner. But <laughs> <laughs> but it was pretty bad. And um, like I said, the only good thing was that I learned the lesson and I didn't lose a ton of my money because I didn't hardly have any money. That I love the way you worded that. For me, it was a company called Punk. Dot com. Wow. <laughs> yeah, and there were so many. I don't even remember that. Yeah, and I, I and I guess the only reason I remember the one you probably remember yours too, because you know it it kind of stings to lose money, mm. but you know there's lessons in that. There's when I when I talk to people, um, when they ask me about you know how should I teach my kid about investing, I don't want him investing in stocks, and I'm like you know go ahead and let him. You know it's mm-hmm. great to show them the gains and how how well a stock is doing, but you know what it's even more valuable to show them when it goes down and how did they feel and to let them know that it doesn't go straight up. So that's an early lesson that is going to serve kids well as they get older and they have more money. A hundred percent. Similar to you, Jackie, if I would have made a ton of money in the doc, I would have thought I was smarter than I was and not bought a diversified portfolio. I learned like you. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah. So Jackie, what inspired, and I want to kind of throw two questions, but what inspired you to join an investment club and how did you find one? Yeah, so that was um, interesting as well. So I I was working for um, um, my company and some of my partners that I worked with were in different locations in the U.S. And I had a friend that was in Boston. And we were talking on the phone one day and she had, she was actually younger than me, but she was um, part of an organization called Better Investing. And I'm like, well, what's that? Because that's when I was, you know, investing in salon.com and some of these crazy, uh, you know, dot com stocks. And she said, well, you know, they teach you about investing in stocks and stuff like that. And I said, I, I definitely, you know, could could use some kind of support system um, versus me just sort of throwing a dart at a board and picking stocks that way. So um, she told me about this organization and that they had investment clubs all over. And she says, I'm in Boston and, and I'm a part of one, but they're all over the country. You should see if there's one in Ohio. So I looked and there was one in Ohio, actually in Cincinnati. And their meetings were open to the public. So I went to a couple of meetings. Um, I appreciated the fact that their parent organization was nonprofit and the people were very nice and they were talking about the stock market in an intelligent way. They knew what they were doing. For me, I had no idea. And it was so interesting to hear these people talk about PE ratios and analyzing a stock and talking about sectors, talking about, you know, growing sales and earnings. And so I came to about three or four of those meetings and then I decided I would like to be a part of it. And that's how I ended up joining an investment club and the learning continues. I felt like everybody there was smarter than me. And I love the idea of not only pooling money, but pooling ideas and knowledge. Like every meeting included a stock presentation and an education segment. So that was important to me because I'm a lifelong learner and I want to learn as we go along. And I could do whatever I wanted to in my personal portfolio, but this club, it was kind of cool that any stock you presented, uh, it would be voted on by all the other club members And each person was assigned a stock that they would follow. And we turned in a stock report every single um, month before we met. And I love the formal way that it was done. Uh, They had very good accounting practices. And um, there wasn't a ton of money that you were even allowed to put in there. I think it was between $20 and $100 a month. You can, you know, contribute as part of the investments. But you could do whatever you wanted to, you know, in your own portfolio. Um, They just kind of wanted you to have some skin in the game and to feel um, involved. So um, I got a lot out of that. And I think that that definitely increased my comfort level with the stock market. Are you still a member of that investment club? I am still a member and and <clears throat> to put some numbers to it, I joined in 2008, which again, turned out to be a great time. And um, I put in the max, the max was $100 a month. Um, but if a, if a partner left and it was a formal partnership, um, if a partner left, you could buy part of their shares. And so I would do that too. So I started in 2008 
And by the time I retired early in uh, 2019, I had, I think, $32,000 in the investment club. And that was probably the smallest piece smallest asset that I had, but it was the most valuable because I had learned so much and it was basically the anchor to everything else I did with my finances and and all the knowledge that I gained was spread across um, all of my other assets as well. So is it, are are organizations like Better Investing, are they taking new members, new clubs if yeah, um, they have something called Model Club. So if you go to the website, it's betterinvesting.org. And again, the parent organization is a nonprofit. And um, you, I think they have a search where you can look at, look for your state and your city. And most chapters around the country, they have what they call a Model Club. And a Model Club is basically where it's open to the public. And this is where I went. It's open to the public. You can observe how they operate. You know, they are sort of the model of how an investment club operates. So they're usually, you know, very formal. You know, you have officers, president, vice president, treasurer is the most important role because they're the ones that's taking care of the financial part. Um, And there's accounting software that they use to make sure that every single member can go on at any time and see their part, what's going on. Very transparent. So, yeah, if somebody wanted to see, actually, most of them are online right now. So if you go to Better Investing and you find a chapter that's a model club, they will publish their meetings and you can um, just sign up, attend a meeting and just um, see what you think. But it's kind of cool to hear people talking about, you know, investments and stocks. Um, So if that's something you want to learn about, um, it it is really cool. And that sort of started my uh, road to understanding how important it was to be invested in the market and, you know, compound growth. And like I said, it kind of was the anchor for all the other things I did with my investments. Is there an age requirement to joining? If a high school or a college student says, wow, this sounds great. (laughs) Right. You know, the funny thing is there are clubs inside of high schools. There's one um, near my home that I was so interested in when I heard that they were doing a high school investment club. So, and they even had, they had like a parent that was the treasurer, but they had the accounting software and everything and they invested real money. I remember their, their biggest holding was Chipotle. Oh. And they, at the time, Chipotle, did, I, I don't know how much, it, what was it $1,500 a share? So at the time they could only afford one share and, you know, partial shares weren't um, a thing. So um, yes, and across the country, there are many high schools that do have investment clubs. Some of them might not invest real money, but it's it's really more about education um, anyway. So that's definitely um, an idea. And you could honestly make your investment club look however you want to. And um, you know, the Better Investing website has a ton of resources that you could use if you if you wanted. But I think learning about the stock market and investing is just so valuable and so important for kids to start learning when they're young. So they're not afraid of it. A hundred percent. Jackie, taking your, if if you would not have had the foresight to reduce your position in the bank stock prior to the financial crisis, we might be having a very different conversation right now. Yeah, we might for sure, because it may have turned me off uh, about the stock market in general. Um, there are so many lessons that I had, and, and I'm, that is one thing that I'm so glad when I look back that I did it and probably was one of the smartest decisions that I made. I mean, as far as dollars back then, it probably wasn't a ton, but over time, boy, what a huge difference. No doubt. When I want to now dive into the, this, all these great choices, and it, it's a really amazing road that you followed, and we're talking about the, the FIRE movement. Prior to the start of the episode, I was actually a firefighter for almost <laughs> 10 years. And we're not talking about that kind right. of fire movement. Right, uh, right. But I had a, a friend in the department who, after his second child was born, cashed out his 401k. And he said, Gene, I only had 30000 in my 401k. We used it to buy a minivan. And we paid cash for the minivan uh. so that we wouldn't have to take debt. And he thought he had made a really good financial decision, Jackie. Right. You made the opposite. Yeah, that's such a that's such a good point. I I didn't even think of it that way, but but you're right. He was starting at 
zero in his 401k the next day after that choice. Wow. Yeah. So let's talk about the fire movement from how you define it, not how I would have defined it in that <laughs> past life. All right. right. Okay, so FIRE today, most people um, have read about it in some of the, the big financial magazines like, like Forbes and Market Watch, but FIRE stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. So the financial independence part, of course, everyone wants that. And to me, the financial independence basically means that you no longer have to depend on income from a job to be able to live and cover your expenses and enjoy life. Now, the retire early part, um, some people, if they love their job, they may not want to retire early. For me, because of what I did in my day job was so different than what I wanted to be doing, I did have to retire early. So I'm pretty um, happy that I was able to get to that point. Now, this was way after my daughter was um, you know, out of high school and, and graduated from college, but I knew that my calling and what I wanted to do and what I believe my mission is um, for being on this earth was to educate people about their finances, financial literacy, especially young people, especially uh, high school kids, college kids, even adults that, that need this. Um, and a lot of times in, in some underserved populations, this is where I wanted to be able to spend my time. And for me, the only way to do that was to remove the full-time job and to create my own income for my investments. So by the time I was maxing out these accounts and keeping up with my net worth, I got to that point. I got to that point where my investment, my nest egg was big enough to where I can live on the money that I was pulling from those accounts. Age of 49, that was wow. in 2019. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then my second question, when you talk about the um, ability to, to live off of the income from your investments, can you back into what that means? And, and think about a student sitting in a classroom right now. Yes. How are so you living off your investments? Okay. So here's what that means. Well, first of all, to know what that number is. Okay. What is that big pot of money supposed to be? The way to come up with that, and you can find this probably on anyone, uh, any site talking about FIRE is 25 times your expenses, not your income, but your expenses. Because I was making, um, on average, when I averaged out the last 10 years I was working, that was about $80,000. That was my income. However, I was putting a lot of my money in you know, my 401k, my IRA, my health savings account. So I was saving a lot. The amount I was actually living off of was $40,000. So that was my number. And if you multiply 40,000, these are all, for all the math whizzes, okay, $40,000 times 25 is what? That is $1 million. So that was my number. And the reason why that pot of money, that $1 million was important to get at is because there's something called the 4% rule where you should be able to take off 4% of your investments, and it should last you for the rest of your life. Now, some people think that that should be 3% or 3.5%. That's fine. The whole idea is that your investments are growing, right? They might be growing at, let's say, 8%. Now, if you only take off 4%, then that money's still growing, and you only took off a little bit of it. So if you just stick with the 4%, I would take off 4% every year, which would be $40,000. Now for me, I still have a little bit of income from, you know, doing some financial literacy sessions and things like that, but that's a small amount, maybe five to $10,000 a year. So I don't really need exactly 4%. And being so young, I can still, I still want to do productive things. There are things that will probably, you know, get me an income. Like if I do consulting, if I do classes or workshops and things like that, that could help me earn additional money that will keep me from having to pull money out. But if you wanted to keep it strictly based on this 4% rule, you could take off 4% or even less if you feel comfortable with it to live off of. And now that money is coming from my investments and not from a paycheck from a job. When you say the money is coming from your investments, 
does that mean you go into your investment account every couple of weeks like a paycheck and just pull some money? Is it dividend yield? How are you getting the money? Okay. So here's what I do. So here's one big problem that I had retiring so early. Most retirement accounts require you to be 59 and a half before you can even touch it. So I had several different roadblocks like this one that kept me saying, eh, I don't know if I should retire. I can't do this. I can't do that. And I kept digging and digging and digging and doing research on, hmm, how can I get the money out? Well, I started a regular brokerage account which means that there's no tax advantage or anything, but you can, you know, open up a brokerage account and I could take that money out anytime I want to. So the first pot of money that I would get at is either the brokerage account where there's no penalty or anything, or remember that I had $32,000 in an investment club. So that my investment club was actually the first pot of money I was looking at. And then I started discovering other things and, and understanding things about some of these retirement accounts where there's actually a lot of different provisions where you might not have to pay a penalty. So the, the big one for me was a Roth IRA. I had my Roth IRA for 15 to 20 years, right? You can take your the contributions to a Roth IRA. You can take them out anytime for anything and you don't pay tax and you don't pay a penalty. So I also have that. So for me, um, Gene, I typically, I've been doing like either quarterly or annually, I will put the money that I need from my investments in a um, in my checking account because I want it there so that I can pay my bills. And that was a little awkward for me, right? Cause I was, I was used to my paycheck coming in there, direct deposit every other week. And now I had to do that myself. Um, I, actually, I don't really like doing it annually because there's things change so much, especially in 2020 with the coronavirus. So uh, during um, the coronavirus, you were actually able to take money out of your traditional IRA and you don't have to pay a penalty. You didn't have to pay a penalty, but that was only 2020. And there were some provisions around that. So um, for me, I think I like quarterly better, but I am still sort of working on the cadence of how I want to get my money out to be able to pay my bills. But primarily I use money for my investment club um, initially, and then money from um, that I had in a brokerage account. And then I can also uh, tap my um, Roth IRA uh, contributions. Well, and Jack, I'm going to, you know, when, when we think of retirement, <laughs> we sometimes think like laying on the beach, right? Right. That, and, that sounds good right about now. <laughs> it, it is cold in the Northeast right now. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've been locked up all this time. It's like, all I want to do is go out and go on a beach. <laughs> how do you define retirement? Is that is that how you define, like, hey, I'm 49, I'm going to just go lay in the beach? Or what was kind of your thought process? Yeah. So here's the thing. I think the word retirement has been completely redefined. Okay. Um, of course, um, the if you look it up in Webster's Dictionary, it's probably going to say something like you're not doing something anymore, which technically is right. I'm not working my corporate job anymore. But I think in the past, back in the day, most people, when they retired, they were in their 70s and they stopped working and they either wanted to play golf or just completely take it easy and they were done. Um, but now I think that's been redefined because now, my idea of retirement is simply that I don't have to depend on the job anymore and that I can do things that I'm passionate about, passion projects, things that bring me joy that I can pick and choose. I can um, do what I want, work with who I want, and there could be some money that comes from that, but I don't have to. I don't have to do things for money anymore because I've got that part taken care of. Like I said, my my real passion is financial literacy, financial education. So I I had that why before I decided to fire. I knew that I wanted to spend the rest of my years uh, educating people about their finances because it made such a difference for me and for my daughter. And so Retirement now, I think, simply means that you've created enough space in your life to do what you love, 
to do on your terms. Oh, so beautiful. I'm pinging, um, connecting to your comment there on the importance of financial education. Can that make what you've accomplished possible for students? Or Jackie, are you this, what you did, hey, <laughs> dream on class of 2021. <laughs> right, I'm, the, right. I'm the exception, not the rule. <laughs> right. So so here's the thing. When, when I met Eugene, um, I had written this book for my daughter because I learned all about finances. And education was such a big deal. It took this little country girl that grew up in poverty that had five siblings raised by a single dad. We were in poverty growing up. And when I talked to a lot of schools, especially like Title I schools or schools that are in underserved populations, I tell them that most people in this room were doing better than me when I was growing up. I was on the free lunch program. Um, my dad was a really proud person, so I never remember that we were on welfare or food stamps. Um, I feel like we would have done better if we were, because everything was always so tight. You know, we didn't get the latest clothes. We had to wear a hand-me-down. You know, we we knew it was payday on Thursday because the refrigerator was empty. So, so this was very tough growing up. And if that little girl from you know, rural South Carolina can start learning about finances, understand money, and go on to retire decades earlier than people told her she could, I know that that needle could be moved by just about anyone. I mean, it's more of a mindset than anything else and, and exposure and being curious and asking questions. And as a kid, that's really hard. I felt so embarrassed sometimes asking questions about certain things because I felt like, like everybody else had so much of an advantage over me that I was lagging behind. So, and I guess that's why I, I, I figured that this was my life's work and it was what I was put on this earth to do. If I went through that experience and I was able to get to the place that I am, starting where I started, shame on me if I didn't try to share that with the world and, and especially people that started in the same place that I did. So... Wow. That was pretty much a perfect answer, Jackie. Um, that is well, so inspirational. Um, well, I mean, that, that is what I believe. So I, I guess I think about the kids that might be in Title I schools that I was, like I was, um, that's watching this. And the teachers. The teachers are amazing, okay? Um, and, and we're in the Zoom world. So I, say, I, I think we were talking and I wasn't doing really any, I was doing a lot of financial education and things like that in high schools before the pandemic. And I really haven't done a lot of Zoom. So especially if there's underserved, really any teacher that, that wants help and would like to invite me into their classroom via Zoom, I'd be happy to do it, especially now that I'm retired. Um, so I feel like it's just my duty. It's just my duty to leave this world in a better place then I found it. And that's such a big mission that um, it makes me feel like when I retired, I didn't really, re I just retired to do bigger and better things. And so it was more like a, a, a transition. Uh, I get up every day, like for instance, you know, we're talking really early this morning, uh, Jean, it's 9 a.m. You know, I never get up that early anymore because I don't have to. And but because I know all the work that you're doing with teachers and schools and financial literacy, and we made that connection um, uh, eight years ago and we both had the same passion, um, you know, this was worth me getting up. So I get up because this is important. And so thank you for, you know, having me today and, and kind of chatting with these teachers, because I think teachers are the most amazing people in the world. And, um, you know, it, this is just what we need to do. So uh, it's like if, you know, if I'm in um, a group of five kids and I'm teaching them about financial literacy, I taught five kids. But if I have teachers, I've taught thousands of people because those teachers are going to teach other people. Yeah. The, the multiplier effect. Yeah. The great multiplier. Well, Jackie, you're, there is so much, um, gosh, to just to say thank you for. I, 
I've tried to summarize this conversation, this journey, because I'm going to ask you one one final question. I'm going to preface the question so you can think about it before I, I give the summary. But the, the question is going to be, what advice would you give your younger self with all that you've experienced? Because what a story. When I hear you, you could have thrown the towel. You could have taken a right or a left hand turn when you were 18 years old and your father passed away. Yeah. You could have got, you know, you mentioned your GPA was what one sliver high enough to graduate, <laughs> but you did it. You right. got, you did it. And you worked full time the entire right. journey working at Walmart, being smart enough to keep that $20,000 invested, right. which is a decision that I think it sounded like you almost took that for granted, but I see the opposite of that. So often it was life-changing. You're right. You're you're making me think about a few things with that that I had not thought about before. And and again, I keep going back to my dad. And so I think it was just a natural thing that was built in me. It's just just because you're poor, it doesn't mean that you're not good with money and you don't um, you don't, can't have good habits because my dad taught me a lot. We didn't have a lot of money. We were poor. But, you know, he taught me about not having debt. He taught me about saving something and all those I think were just built in me because um, I think about why did I make those decisions? I, yeah, I did start doing some research, but most of it came from sort of these natural tendencies that I think I learned growing up and, and we get socialized, you know, in our household from the time that we're, we're little kids and, and, and things stick with us. And a lot of what he, what he was talking about and what he was doing and, and, and just being a good example just stuck with me. Gosh. Well, as a father, I can tell you, I admire your father just based on everything yeah. you've said today, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, thank you. This, uh, what a journey, what an inspiration. Um, I, I can't say thank you enough for joining us today. To everyone listening, uh, Jackie cummings an author, a speaker, an educator. And uh, I'm going to use the word force multiplier. <laughs> well, I love that that word. That's a great new word. Now, I do want to mention something, especially for uh, kids. I, I, I mentioned it briefly before, but I was always, when I was younger, I definitely felt like I had less than just about everyone around me. And I felt like I was asking stupid questions. And I remember I had a teacher one time to tell me there are no stupid questions. The only stupid questions are the ones that you don't ask. And I, I sort of took that to another level in that when you're, when you think you're asking a stupid question, you're really ask be, you're being brave and you're asking a question that probably a bunch of other people are thinking about but they're not brave enough to ask. So you asking the stupid question could be helping out so many other people. And so I don't call them stupid questions anymore. I call them courageous questions. So when you raise your hand and you want to ask something that you think is stupid, say, I have a courageous question, not a stupid question. Oh, 100%. That is powerful, Jackie. Yeah. I've never heard it framed quite that way. I, you know, I just started thinking about that because I, I'm like, why did I feel like everything was so stupid? And maybe we shouldn't even call them stupid questions. So, you know, how we label things. So let's label it differently now. Students ask a courageous question. Ask a courageous question. Yeah. Jackie, thank you so much. This was great. Thanks, Gene. It was so great catching up with you. Oh. Everyone tuning in, thank you for listening and uh, share this episode. This was a powerful, powerful conversation. Thank <laughs> you.